morning and welcome to Rising. Thank you for joining us on this Monday. Brianna Joy Gray is off today, so I'm joined remotely by Jessica Burbank. Nice to see you, Jessica. Good to be with you, Robbie. What's the news? Well, let's get right into it. Uh, we've got a major development on Israel-Palestine. New Speaker of the House Mike Johnson has confirmed to NBC News yesterday that he will bring a bill funding military and humanitarian aid for Israel and Israel alone this week, undermining the Biden administration's plans to couple funding for Israel with Ukraine. Now, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene has come out against Johnson's bill, writing on Twitter just this morning, I will be voting no on all funding packages for the Ukraine war, as I have from the beginning and now the Israel war. We have had over 10 million people illegally cross our border since Biden took office, and we're over $33 trillion in debt, with many major problems afflicting Americans. The United States government needs to focus on spending Americans' hard-earned tax dollars on our own country and needs to serve the American people, not the rest of the world. This comes as nearly three dozen trucks carrying aid and humanitarian supplies entered the Gaza Strip yesterday. The Palestinian Health Ministry now claims death tolls in the region have topped 8,000. Israeli tanks and infantry continue to prepare for what Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called the IDF's second stage in its war against Hamas. Airstrikes continued to pummel the region over the weekend even after a brief and total communications blackout left the people of Gaza without any cell phone or internet service for 34 hours. Several Western media outlets have now reported that per U.S. intelligence, Israel intentionally shut off Gazans' access to the outside world. It was only at the Biden administration's private urging, according to the Washington Post, did Israel reverse the blackout. One official told the Post, quote, we made it clear they had to be turned back on and need to stay back on, end quote. Executive Director of the Quincy Institute, Dr. Trita Parsi, hit out at President Biden over the reporting, tweeting, Biden's pressure on Israel isn't to prevent mass killings and war crimes. Rather, its pressure appears aimed at keeping Israel's bombings and war crimes at a tolerable level to keep the backlash against Israel manageable. Biden is doing war crimes management for Netanyahu. Over the weekend, thousands of people all over the world, uh, in, from Central Park to London, took to local public spaces and streets to call for an immediate ceasefire in the region. A United Nations resolution urging ceasefires passed with 120 member nations voting yes and 14 voting no. Topping the nose was, of course, the United States. So many developments obviously taking place over the weekend. Um, I, I find it interesting that our new speaker, uh, Mike Johnson, uh, you know, not going along with the Biden plan to combine all the spending into one package, which is how um, President Biden was seeking to arrange for the Ukraine continued funding in addition to Israel. Mike Johnson says there will be a vote just on Israel funding. And it's go I think it remains to be seen how many Republicans are even on board with that. I, I suggest I suspect there's enough of them. But someone like a Marjorie Taylor Greene, sick of spending um, American tax dollars overseas at every turn, says, no, I'm not on board. Yeah, I think it makes sense that there's a growing group of members of Congress that are not supportive of the amount of military assistance, frankly, going to Israel and to Ukraine. And when you look at what the American public believes, it seems that the majority of people don't support aid going to Israel. Only 41 percent support more weapons going to Israel. That's precisely what military aid would be. So I'm surprised it's not even more members of Congress. We only had nine members of Congress vote against Mike Johnson's initial resolution as soon as he got into to office vowing their support for Israel. So I think things will change as increasing public sentiments go in the opposite direction. But I think Percy makes a good point there that their explicit intent media wise is to make this manageable, make it so that they convince the American people uh, that Israel needs American support and that U.S. military assistance is justified. They're fighting up against a lot of posts on social media where people get to see precisely what's going on in Gaza, which is absolutely why Israel shut down the communications for 24 or sorry, 34 hours hours uh, while they had this huge bombing campaign in Gaza. And so it's really difficult PR for the Biden administration because they're now going to have to justify in the opposite direction of where public opinion is right now. It's a position they've never 
Bennett in Israel. And so I think more members of Congress are getting pressured by their constituents to kind of draw back U.S. support for Israel because of how gruesome this campaign of bombing has been against Gaza and as the ground mission commences. Yeah, I mean, I think people are seeing these images and obviously, you know, bemoaning the innocent lives being lost um, that have been lost on both sides of the conflict, um, you know, wanting, I, I, th I think, the American people want to, you know, condemn what has obviously had the terrorist attack that happened to Israel. But at some point, it becomes we're gonna we're gonna have to fund, we're funding this the the, the attacks, the, the military attacks. Then we're gonna have to fund the cleanup and the and the you know the humanitarian aid afterwards. Like we, we're gonna destroy something, then we're gonna pay. To, we're paying to destroy it. We're paying to build it. You know, why is that money not being spent at home? Is this a a uh, relatable U.S. national security goal, and does it risk us being drawn into a broader conflict? So what do you make of President Biden's efforts so far to, it seems like, talk Netanyahu out of more extreme action, but obviously has not prevented you know, the, the, the invasion we're seeing, the bombing campaign we're seeing? Yeah, I think a lot of the human rights violations that Netanyahu has committed and the Netanyahu administration, the IDF, has committed since October 7th are indefensible. And so Biden's in an impossible position being a continued ally of Israel because there's already so much that the public knows about that's been reported on by the United Nations, by international groups, even by U.S. mainstream media. So the Biden administration in defending Israel, they're in an impossible possible position. I think now they have to take the really honest approach, one that Biden used to take back in the 80s when he was a senator and say, listen, I get that you guys don't like what Israel is doing, but this is a, a choice we're willing to, to make. We're willing to commit war crimes in the region so that U.S. interests can be protected in the Middle East. That's precisely the decision they're making without saying it. And so if Biden wants any kind of you know response from the American people that's favorable, he's going to need to take the path I think of honesty. He has no other choice moving forward here. This is clearly the strategic calculation that the United States military, foreign policy establishment, and administration is taking. It's the calculation that they've made here. And so they're going to need to just tell the American people, listen, it's too late. We've already supported Israel for too long. It's either we quell the discontent with what Israel's doing in the region, or else we're going to have a huge threat against the United States based on the actions already taken. We're in a point of no return here. That's the position I think that the Biden administration is taking behind closed doors. And if they want the support of the American people, they need to take it publicly. They can say, listen, we've now decided to reverse our decision and support a humanitarian pause. Aid has reached Gaza. 33 trucks reportedly reached Gaza on Sunday, but they're used to getting uh, 500 trucks a day, 33 trucks of aid into Gaza between October uh, 7th and the 21st is not enough when they're used to getting 500 a day. Six hospitals have closed down. 10 hospitals have people sheltering in them beyond having surgeries. People are getting C-sections without any anesthesia. The situation there is dire and the United States at least needs to support giving more humanitarian aid to the people in Gaza and to be honest about what their strategic interests are in the region if they want any kind of support from the American people. Well, I mean, I feel the same way about the humanitarian aid as I do as the military aid, that it's not, the American taxpayer has been generous enough and it's not our obligation. I think if President Biden, if the federal government were to say, we support Israel's right to root out the terrorist group that just shot people in their cars and took people prisoner at a music festival, and it is obvious that they're going to try to dismantle and destroy this terrorist group. We hope that it involves as few civilian deaths as possible. A lot of the policies they're pursuing, we don't support, but we're not, it's their problem, it's not our problem. Um, the federal government of the United States, the Biden administration's first task is to make America a more livable place for the taxpaying citizens of this country, not to send their dollars to all other foreign battlefields. If, if it was, if we were you know, just trying to prevent humanitarian crises all over the country that would involve having conflicts with China and Russia and we'd be more involved in Africa and it's just not the job of the American government so we will not fund this effort anymore. Now I think people are uh, under, will will be upset about the, the double standard. The amount of support may, Israel has gotten more support than any other country for the last 50 60 years. Um, I don't I don't know that that that's the, uh, there, there's, I, I think there's a lot of sympathy for what Israel is going for, what it's suffered, and also sympathy, of course, for the uh, Palestinians caught in the middle. But the, I think the most popular thing would be not 
not to like oppose, not to give more humanitarian aid instead of more military aid, but to just leave this other country to handle this region to solve its own problems and not say it's America's responsibility. Yeah, I don't think the American people need to give any more tax dollars towards this issue. Uh, they could do it absolutely for free. All it would take is the United States not vetoing the humanitarian pause on the floor of the Security Council of the United Nations. They're the lone vote in the Security Council vetoing a humanitarian pause so that aid could access the Gazans. We don't need to even give them any American dollars. We just need the United States to stop supporting Israel's war campaign against the people in Gaza, killing innocent civilians with 6,000 bombs and 4,000 tons of explosives at the point that they had this vote. All they had to do was have their ambassador simply not raise their hands. It would be entirely free for the American people. But the Biden administration wouldn't even have their representative do that. And I think that's absurd. It would just take the United States to stop supporting Israel's killing of people in Gaza for aid to reach them. All they had to do was say, yes, a humanitarian pause, a temporary ceasefire. It would be entirely free. And so I think it's ridiculous. They funded uh, Israel's occupation of Palestine with $158 billion over the years. We're not giving any aid to Gazans. We're, we're proposing giving aid to Israel and only Israel, military aid and humanitarian aid, which is absurd because Israel has caused, caused a humanitarian crisis. They don't need humanitarian aid at this point in time. They also don't need military aid. And so it's not that the Palestinians are stuck in the middle of this, it's that we've had Israel occupy the land of Palestine and expand their state into Palestinian territory beyond international agreements. And the United States has supported Israel every step of the way. And so it's time for the United States to reckon with that history. And I think that means calling for a ceasefire now just to allow the humanitarian aid to come from the international organizations into Gaza at this point. And I think we're putting the American people at more risk by giving more military aid to Israel after all of their human rights violations. The Leahy Act, which is the United States law, prohibits the United States from giving funding to any organization, military group, or government that is committing human rights violations. So we're breaking our own law if we continue to fund Israel after they have admitted to doing collective punishment and various other war crimes in Gaza, admitted to killing citizens. And so we're breaking our own laws if we vote to fund more military aid to Israel. And Mike Johnson's going to have to deal with that. So is the Biden administration. Hamas is, uh, there's been reporting, it has stockpiled um, a lot of that very, the humanitarian aid that makes it through. M many of the supplies are being held by, they're captured by Hamas and held by Hamas. So do you, do you discount uh, entirely the idea that Israel might have that allowing through just trucks of this, these supplies, these supplies will not reach the innocent people of Gaza who are every much as victims of uh, Hamas as anyone else who, you know, are are not Hamas is not focused on providing any of these resources or services um, to the people ostensibly under its rule. So a lot of people living in Gaza are just 18 years old. The last time they held elections was about 2007. A lot of these people were not old enough to vote or participate in the elections. Now, Hamas is the official governing body of Gaza. They are the group that got elected into office, and many of the people that rely on them to get supplies didn't vote for them. Nevertheless, they are the governing body, so of course they're going to be the ones redistributing a part of the humanitarian aid if it's directly delivered to them. Now, there's Doctors Without Borders operating in Gaza. There's the, the office of uh, the Center for or Humanitarian Assistance uh, coming from the United United Nations that's operating there. There's a lot of independent international groups that are operating there that can directly get supplies independent from the official government in the region. And so there are 10 hospitals still operating, holding refugees right now. Six of them had to shut down because of lack of fuel and water. They can deliver the supplies directly to the hospitals. Uh, the idea that Hamas would take the supplies, and that's a reason why we shouldn't have a ceasefire, that's a reason humanitarian aid should not be allowed to enter the Gaza Strip, it's absurd. They could absolutely go through Doctors Without Borders and all of the international agencies that are operating in Gaza and have been for quite some time. So that's not a concern that I have, and that absolutely shouldn't prevent people from bringing humanitarian aid into Gaza or supporting a ceasefire for Gaza. But shouldn't Hamas use the humanitarian aid that it has, or the, the, the supplies that it has stockpiled, that it's not giving to the people that it ostensibly governs? Um, isn't it their responsibility as the, I mean, they're not, as you, I agree with you, you're right to point out they're not, the, they, the government lacks legitimacy, they suspended elections, it's a dictatorship, um, but they, they have resources that they've been stockpiling, keeping from the people. It, why is it not their responsibility to, to, to provide the food and shelter and water and medical supplies that they 
have in their possession? I think the the UNRA, the United Nations agency that's been providing aid to the Palestinians for quite some time, would be the responsible body for providing humanitarian aid now. Gazans directly go to their warehouses and receive the materials and supplies, food, fuel, and water that they would need. So I don't think it's an, an issue that if Hamas has some of the materials that have been given to the Gazans, uh, that that means that we shouldn't support more humanitarian aid for the many civilians, 1.1 million, that are living in the Gaza Strip. Uh, Northern Gazans can't even get out because they don't have the fuel to drive cars to exit. Many people are trapped in hospitals because they're carpet bombing the country. We need a humanitarian pause so that people can get out. The Israel military is giving these announcements in English for a largely Arabic speaking population saying that they're going to complete a ground mission in Northern Gaza and everyone needs to leave and then bombing the exit, shutting off communication so no one has a way of traveling to get out or communicating with anyone to receive the announcement that's not even in the language they speak. So I think it's ridiculous to assume that any aid that goes to these people that are struggling, that are experiencing a blockade from the Israeli government, uh, that that is a reason why we can't support them and give them the food, fuel, and water that they desperately need. 50,000 women in Gaza are pregnant. 5,500 are expected to give birth in the next month. Because there's a chance that some people in Hamas might get some of that humanitarian aid, that's a reason we shouldn't help those people. I think that's just a ridiculous argument to make, especially when so many Gazans get their aid directly from these UN agencies and these international groups. So I really think that the Gazans need a humanitarian pause so that they can receive the aid. And also because we've had so much carpet bombing from the Israeli people, they shut off communications for 34 hours hours so that they could bomb people living in the dark who don't even have access to call paramedics or healthcare. The average age of the population, or sorry, the median age in Gaza is 18. Most of these people are children. It's just disgusting what the Israeli government is doing. The least thing we can do is bring humanitarian aid into Gaza. Mm. All right. We'll have more rising right after this.